Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. This one is packed. We're going to be talking about DRAM and NAND prices set to fall once again. NVIDIA's RTX 3090 allegedly pictured in one of our rumors we're talking about this week. In actual hard news, Hot Chips 32 had Xbox Series X SoC details to talk about, IBM Power PC architecture information as well. TSMC's fab is running laps around Intel right now, earnings calls and shortages for some specific motherboard components, along with a couple of other things. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Be Quiet PureBase 500DX. The PureBase 500DX is a new push from Be Quiet into mesh fronted cases that are more thermally focused. The 500DX maintains high build quality and attention to detail for its dust filters, front panel installation, and fan placement, and still has additional focus on noise control. The case comes with three 140mm Pure Wayne's 2 fan stock and has RGB LEDs, but with a physical hardware switch for easy control. Learn more about the Be Quiet Pure Base 500DX at the link in the description below. So first up, we just concluded our newest charity drive for Eden Reforestation projects. We'll be sharing the donation receipt and some of the other information on that in a moment. And last week on uh, store.gamersnexus.net, we restocked the large mod mats, which we've struggled to keep in stock ever since we launched them three years ago. The mouse mats and the medium mod mats were also restocked, bringing this up because that was part of our drive we did for Eden Reforestation projects, which again, I'll go over the, the numbers for what we raised for them in a moment. So large mod mats sold out completely in under a day. Sorry. We've been trying really hard to get ahead of them for three years now. It's really difficult because it's an expensive product to make, so we basically need the money from the sales to make more of them. So it's hard to keep up with, and they're really popular. Uh, the medium mod mats are still in stock and shipping now, though. So there should be plenty of those for a while. If you want to go to store.gamersnexus.net and pick one up, it uses the same high-quality anti-static rubberized material and is made in the same clean room manufacturing facility we use for the large mod mats. The medium mats have a video card PCB layout, naming references table, a grid for screw tracking and component disassembly, some two scale hole spacing diagrams, and it's also portable at 32 by 16. Uh, inches or 811 by 406 millimeters in non-freedom units. And then the wireframe mouse mat restock was our largest stock ever, the biggest purchase we've ever done. And that is now under 25% inventory remaining, which is insane after one week. So anyway, thanks for that. We are using that money to fund uh, equipment purchases for testing. And then of course, we gave a percentage of that to Eden Reforestation Projects. We did a match with community donations if you wanted to bypass our store and just give straight to uh, Eden Reforestation Projects. We matched up to $1,500, so we did hit that mark. And this started after the Linus Tech Tips troubleshooting challenge from a couple weeks, maybe two weeks ago now, which you should watch if you haven't. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so we ran it from August 8th to August 20th, where we offered a portion of our store's revenue for uh, Eden Reforestation Projects. We put up the match, and then our distributor also kicked in a generous amount as well this time, just like you did last time. So altogether total, we are happy to share this receipt with you of a $7,080 donation to Eden Reforestation Projects. If you're not familiar with them, GN worked with the group last year and we, with the community, were able to plant about 90,000 trees through them. Their cost is around 10 cents per tree. It goes up a bit for things like mangroves, but depends on the type of tree. I've personally been supporting them for around maybe two to three years now, and the group employs impoverished people to reforest deforested land and does so in a scientific fashion, which we support. They research the correct mix of biology and invest in biodiversity and regions, as well as the people who live there. So it creates lasting jobs because the planters have to take care of the forest and protect it. And we like the work we do. We're happy to make this contribution. And a huge thanks to our viewers as well for making it possible. And next week, you'll want to check back as well, because we're going to list something up for a charity auction for one that Jay chose, Jay's Two Cents from the Linus Tech Challenge. We've got that extra trophy, that spoiler alert, it skipped five seconds, but we've got that second place trophy that we don't need because we got first. So we're going to auction that off for his charity. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, keep an eye on that for next week. All right, so first real news item is DRAM and NAND prices set to fall. Both DRAM and NAND prices look like they're going to come down. This seems to be like a regular, it's almost like you could map it to the lunar schedule at this point where every full moon, the RAM prices and DRAM prices will either rise or fall depending on what they were previously uh, and depending on whether there's price fixing going on. But in this one, they're looking to come down again. This is according to reports from both Digitimes and DRAM Exchange. DRAM Exchange really has uh, its finger on the pulse of the RAM and the NAND market. If you're not familiar with them, they have pricing updates 
daily. So it seems like memory prices are set to fall throughout the last half of 2020, according to the reports right now. And they extend that into at least the first quarter of 2021. And as ever, the memory market does ebb and flow. So things could change, but it's pretty predictable for at least a quarter just because people kind of know what new phones are coming out, what new video cards, for example, are coming out, which will impact uh, GDDR availability. Um, but as is usually the case, the price decline is based on this point on oversupply in the market. And uh, as it relates to NAND flash, the oversupply stems from buyers stockpiling back when the uh, human malware concerns started. Uh, manufacturers started to stockpile because they were concerned about economic impact later on. So that excess inventory has been carried over month over month at this point. And it seems as if demand is remaining relatively flat, both in the PC and the server space. Overall, there were a lot of purchases, but not to the extent that memory and NAND was purchased leading into all of this. So we've got a quote here, quote, Trend Force believes that despite the traditional peak season for electronic sales, and the release of Apple's new iPhones in third quarter 20, the quarterly decline in NAND Flash ASP, or average selling price, will likely reach 10% due to the client end's excess inventory under the impact of the pandemic, end quote. And that one's from DRAM Exchange. This story is much the same with DRAM as customers stockpiled memory for fear of the supply chain falling out over the course of human malware. While DRAM sales were up in general for second quarter 21, it seems OEMs are still sitting on an excess of inventory. Quote, Trendforce indicates that server OEMs are now carrying a rather high level of DRAM inventory after aggressively stocking up for two consecutive quarters. At the same time, customers of enterprise servers are holding back on procurement because the economic outlook is getting bleaker and more uncertain, says DRAM Exchange. The result, it seems, will be a decline in both DRAM shipments and prices beginning in third quarter 20. And quote, as such, Trendforce forecasts at best a flattening of product shipments and decrease in DRAM prices in third quarter, with DRAM suppliers suffering a decline in profitability. And as always with our hardware news recaps, you can find these sources for this in the show notes document below if you want to read more on any individual story. This one especially. DRAM Exchange uh, has, has good numbers up. All right, rumor time. So NVIDIA RTX 3090 cards allegedly photographed. It's kind of hard to balance not really wanting to report on rumors and people being extremely interested in them. Uh, so we do try to balance it with things that seem like they are probably going to happen. But regardless, this is technically in rumor status. What we know for fact is that RTX 3090s, or whatever they end up calling it, it looks like it's going to be 3090 at this point, is going to be a product. This is something we confirmed Privately last week when we spoke with uh, Adam Board Partners with NVIDIA, also known as AIBs or AIB Partners, and they confirmed that there is going to be a high-end, like a flagship launch, 3090 is the current known name, and there's going to be something like a 3080 when that comes out. Our current understanding is that the 3090 will come after the 3080, but that could change. NVIDIA often decides things last minute backstage when there's an actual press event, so who knows what they're going to do. Either way, though, that's the current plan. So uh, a couple of other things we know, photos of the shroud design for the 3080 and 3090 appear to be accurate as well, at least for the reference card. Uh, we also know that not all cards will look like that. The board partners will do what they want, just like always. There's, as we understand it, not any special silicon on the back of the card that needs to be cooled. So feasibly, they could roll forward with the usual gaming X or uh, whatever their other names are. Uh, they escape me. Frozer. I guess I'm thinking MSI right now. So they'll roll forward with the normal ones. Uh, we'd also like to highlight that the 12 pin connector for reference cards is also something we previously confirmed. This is not going to be on all of the cards. So board partners are free to use whatever connector they want, so long as it delivers the power required. The 12 pin connector is also not as simple as adding six plus six from your power supply to get 12 because it's more than just the pin count for the power delivery. You're also talking wire gauge, which is the big one. We don't at least I don't know what they've done yet for wire gauge. Uh, and then the pinout, of course, could change as well. So that's going to be a reference thing in the very least. Uh, and then finally, for the new rumors, Twitter user Garnet Sunset, who is competing with Momomo underscore US for most wanted leaker, tweeted that the 3090 will allegedly be a three slot design. The PCB is also plus sized, if these photos are accurate, running taller than the PCIe slot. Another user in the thread, Kman1891, took the time to scale the PCIe slots to match and get a better sense of scale. 
If this is, in fact, a real 3090, then it's going to be a large card. There may be room yet for AIBs to compete in the two-slot department, if thermally possible, but we'll see. And that'll be interesting as well, because NVIDIA has been competing more and more with its board partners over the years. It's gotten more aggressive in competing with them as it's tried to advance its own cooler designs out of status of being a complete joke into something that's at least sustainable out of the box. So uh, this is a, a bit of a change in direction going towards the larger form factor cards. It'll be really interesting to work with. We're definitely going to have a lot of what if and because we can test for this one. Uh, Hot Chips 32. So Microsoft offered some more details on the AMD SoC that's powering its upcoming Xbox Series X. We know a bit about this already officially through both AMD and Microsoft in the past, but there's been a lot more details released at the Hot Chips event. So uh, the SoC for the Xbox Series X will be built on a 12 layer stack sub for the substrate, and it will consist of 15.3 billion transistors for this one. It will also have a die area of 360.4 millimeters squared. Just to clarify, this is news, not a rumor from the like the previous one. The new SoC is also being built on TSMC's somewhat nebulous N7 enhanced node. Uh, TSMC has several N7 nodes with various suffixes. This is one where we don't have as much detail on what the word enhanced precisely means, at least as of filming. Relative to TSMC's other N7 nodes, we know that it's not N7. Uh, we know that it is possibly some variation of N7P or N7 Plus, but so far everyone has kept surprisingly quiet about it. Moving on, one of the more important things about this generation is the increased SoC cost. Looking back at the Xbox One X, that SoC was built on 16 nanometers and packed around 6.6 .6 billion transistors. That meant that the transistor density has more than doubled for this generation. Furthermore, Microsoft is noting that N7E added complex steps and structures to an already large and complex heterogeneous SoC. That said, the cost per wafer has greatly increased, and the yield count per wafer has decreased, which means a significant increase in cost per die. There's more waste per wafer. Microsoft seems to be trying to offset these costs by implementing in-hardware engines to help ease power and die cost. The HW engines, or hardware engines as Microsoft calls them, seem to focus on audio, security, decoding, and decompression. Additionally, the SoC will feature eight cores spread out over two quad-core clusters, and uh, these cores will be clocked at 3.8 gigahertz. On the GPU side, there will be 52 CUs in total, or 26 dual CUs as we understand it right now, with four SIMDs and for ALUs. The GPU will come with support for variable rate shading or VRS and sampler feedback streaming and DirectX ray tracing are also supported. Also at Hot Chips 32, IBM took the wraps off of its Power 10 processor. IBM was uh, revealing its new Power 10 processor and architecture, which is the successor, big surprise, to Power 9. 9 is actually the number that comes before 10. This is why you come to us for the news. Probably not many people told you that fact, but we thought it was important to the story. So knowing that 9 comes before 10, one could assume the next one might be 11. You got that rumor here first. And if you recall, IBM's Power 9 chips are what power the Summit and Sierra supercomputers, which, until the arrival of Fugaku that we covered previously, were the first and second most powerful supercomputers in the top 500 list. Power 10 will be based on the Power ISA, specifically Power ISA v3.1. But the overall P10 architecture is being overhauled for better memory latency and bandwidth, improved I.O., and a focus on performance per watt. The Power 10 chips will be built on Samsung's 7 nanometer process, said to make use of an 18-layer metal stack and 18 billion transistors. The Power 10 processors will come as either single-chip modules, SCM, or dual-chip modules, DCM. Each Power 10 chip is built with 16 cores, but will come with 15 enabled in an effort to stabilize yields. Each P10 core is either 8-way, SMT8, or 4-way multi-threaded, SMT4, meaning that a single P10 chip is capable of 120 threads per socket, or SMT8. A dual-mode chip doubles that to 240 threads per socket, again SMT8. The reworked memory system for P10 supports both the Open Memory Interface, or OMI, and Power Axon Interface, with both interfaces capable of 1 terabyte per second. Power 10 also supports DDR5 and PCIe Gen 5. So, uh, with support 
for 64 PCIe Gen 5 lanes, IBM is uh, one-upping AMD. It wasn't Intel. They couldn't get there. It was IBM. The clock speeds, obviously, they're not quite competitors, but you get, well, in that space, but you get the idea. Not x86. So clock speeds look to be in the range of 3.5 gigahertz to just over 4 gigahertz at the time being, and systems based on Power 10 are expected sometime towards the end of 2021. And if you'd like to read more about this one, there are a lot of resources out there. Uh, there's hot chips references and uh, documents, slideshows. There's the newsroom from IBM and then Anantech as well has a detailed write-up. TSMC up next. So TSMC's fab is currently running laps around Intel's fabs. Last week, Taiwan Semiconductor announced that it had fabricated its one billionth die from good yield. So this is non-defective dyes that it is manufacturing. They've now reached one billion of those. The company began volume production of seven nanometer in April of 2018, and that includes Apple, AMD, Huawei, and car companies. Uh, and actually, Intel now is a customer of other process nodes as well. Just for fun, TSMC calculated that its one billion seven nanometer chips would be equal to 13 Manhattan city blocks. Although TSMC did not say if it smells the same as 13 Manhattan city blocks. TSMC highlighted that its yields have improved with practice, but says that it's still not easy to make chips on seven nanometer process. As a reminder, Intel's version of seven nanometer and TSMC's version aren't equivalent. People often argue over the lower number being better and kind of leave it at that, but it's really not that simple. There's other stuff at play like density too. Uh, that said, uh, TSMC 7 does exist, and Intel's 10 barely exists. So at least in the DIY space, the point has sort of stopped mattering. TSMC absolutely has a lead at this point. Here's what TSMC had to say of its accomplishment. Quote, we have extended our 7 nanometer technology into a new family member, our N6 process. N6 is in volume production today using EUV, or extreme ultraviolet lithography, to replace conventional immersion layers. TSMC's N6 offers a new standard cell with nearly 20% logic density improvement. Its design rules are completely compatible with its N7 predecessor, and it delivers an excellent cost-effective option for our customers' next wave of 7 nanometer generation designs." End quote. Up next, NVIDIA reported its second quarter of 2021 earnings. Fiscal years are strange things. And in that report, it said that the company has notched a record quarter, most notably NVIDIA and its data center segment earned more than the gaming segment for the first time in the company's history. To be fair, this is about two years after RTX, so that shift could come in September, back towards gaming. In total, NVIDIA is reporting a record revenue of $3.87 billion, which is a 50% increase year over year and roughly 26% quarter over quarter. A couple of key things have happened in quarter two that have driven NVIDIA's revenue, the closing of the Mellanox acquisition and ramping of A100 accelerator sales are the main ones. NVIDIA closed the Mellanox deal back in April, and that added no less than 14% to NVIDIA's revenue, all of which is accounted for in the data center. Additionally, NVIDIA's A100 accelerators had the full run of quarter two to drive sales, unlike the previous quarter. By segment, NVIDIA's data center segment saw $1.75 billion in revenue, up 54% quarter over quarter, and 167% year over year. Again, that's thanks to Mellanox and NVIDIA's continued sales of A100 systems. For gaming, NVIDIA recorded $1.65 billion in revenue, up 24% quarter over quarter, and 26% year over year. NVIDIA's gaming segment revenue was fueled by a spike in demand for gaming, uh, for GPUs specifically, and for laptops, primarily thanks to the pandemic that has forced everyone to work, learn, and play games from home the last several months. Shoring up NVIDIA's revenue were uh, its segments in professional visualization and automotive markets, where the two markets captured $203 million and $111 million, respectively, for the company. And looking ahead to quarter three of 21, again, strange fiscal years. Uh, NVIDIA is forecasting a $4.4 billion quarter. And finally, quarter three should also see the arrival of the new Ampere GeForce cards in the RTX 3000 lineup, if that's what it ends up being called. So those won't be fully reflected in NVIDIA's earnings until fourth quarter of its fiscal year. If you got the Windows 10 update that acts sort of like malware, that's it's not really specific enough, that's most of them. But if you got the one where it pops up the box and makes it difficult to exit, then uh, you likely know about Microsoft's moving Edge to Chromium. And with that move came Microsoft's attempt to 
phase out Microsoft Edge, the original version, and the Microsoft Internet Explorer browser. So it sounds like non-Chromium Legacy Edge and IE are getting ever closer to making that trip to the great browser window in the sky. While IE 11 isn't going away entirely, Microsoft is taking big steps in what appears to be the beginning of the death knell for the browser. And with Microsoft's Chromium-based version of Edge, there's no need for Legacy Edge at this point. Microsoft announced that after August 17th, 2021, IE 11 would no longer be supported with any uh, Microsoft Office 365 app, which is actually significant. Microsoft Teams support ends even sooner, with November 30th, 2020, marking the end of support for IE 11. And to that end, Microsoft states that IE 11 isn't going away entirely, and that Edge's Internet Explore mode will offer legacy support as well. As for the Chromium build of Edge, it's done. Love it or hate it, it's here at this point, and Microsoft's Chromium-based Edge has been a huge success. It's taken away uh, more of the dwindling share of Firefox's browser user base at this point as well. So there's no turning back now. Legacy Edge will sunset by March 9th of 2021 or just after. And meanwhile, IE6 remains in safe refuge at college campuses and government offices across the country. Up next, Intel is defending its AVX 512 and is promising frequency improvements. AVX 512 seems to keep coming up in the news cycle lately, mostly in non-flattering ways. First, the number one or number two Linus, depending on how you count him. Uh, we're gonna go with number one here. Sorry, other Linus. Uh, Linus Torvalds wished a painful death and criticized the frequency penalty of AVX 512 for uh, its workloads and referred to it as a power virus. We covered this probably about a month ago now. And then, after that, former Intel engineer Francois Pignol echoed Torvald's sentiment to an extent and called AVX 512 a mistake. However, Intel is here to pick up and defend for its beloved instruction set. Intel defended against these critics, and that defense came from none other than Intel's current chief architect, Raja Kadori, formerly from AMD. Quote, AVX 512 is a great feature. Our HPC community, AI community love it. Our customers on the data center side really, really, really love it, Raja Kadori told PC World. This is actually an argument we're extremely interested in. Unfortunately, that's not a particularly useful quote for figuring out what's going on. But anyway, that's what Intel had to say. So there's been a frequency and performance penalty for executing AVX 512 instructions. This helps with maintaining the thermal performance required for the processors. And as evidenced by the downclocking on Skylake X and Skylake SP CPUs when running AVX 512, uh, clearly the frequency drops. That's also why there's an AVX offset in your BIOS. So the wider vector instruction set has also been criticized for taking up too much transistor and die budget for chips that don't really need them. Uh, for example, mobile chips and generalist Xeons. Kadori addressed this as well by stating that the AVX 512 frequencies are improving generation over generation. That's something that Travis Downs, who runs the Performance Matters blog, was able to substantiate as well. Downs tested an Ice Lake i5-1035 CPU for AVX 512 downclocking and summarized his findings as follows, quote, the Ice Lake i5-1035 CPU exhibits only 100 megahertz of license-based downclock with one active core when running 512-bit instructions. There is no downclock in any other scenario. The all-core 512-bit turbo frequency of 3.3 is 89% of the maximum single-core scalar frequency of 3.7 gigahertz. So within power and thermal limits, this chip has a very flat frequency profile. Unlike Skylake X, this Ice Lake chip does not distinguish between light and heavy instructions for frequency scaling purposes. Fuse multiply add operations behave the same as lighter operations. On the topic of certain chips not needing AVX 512 support, Kadori stated that Intel has to develop for the x86 ecosystem, which means building everything from a server to laptop components. Quote, so when we do a CPU core and add an instruction to it, historically the power of x86 and our instruction set extensions have been that we made them available everywhere. Because of that, when we have an IP like Sunny Cove and it appears both in a server, like an Ice Lake server, and on a client, like Ice Lake client, you get the commonality of the instruction set. So as we said previously, despite its detractors, it looks like AVX 512 isn't going anywhere right now. And PC World has a write-up on that one if you're curious uh, more about the uh, painful death that is wished upon AVX 512 by its critics. And finally, a report on PWM doubler shortages right now affecting motherboards. This is a report from OC3D, I believe they had the exclusive on this, and it seems that there's a shortage of PWM doublers 
and that shortage is expected to force motherboard OEMs to redesign some of their boards. According to OC3D, Gigabyte has already made moves to revise two of its more budget-oriented B550 boards. PWM phase doublers are prevalent across all motherboard price segments, but the impact of the doubler shortage is likely to be concentrated in the budget segment. According to an OC3D exclusive, and these B550 chipset-based boards are expected to be hit the hardest. OC3D is reporting that Gigabyte has designed two new SKUs due to the shortage, the B550 Aorus Elite V2 and the Aorus Elite AX V2. Both carry the V2 designation to mark the absence of PWM phase doublers. If you've watched our Buildzoid videos, you've seen the trend over the last few years of motherboard makers increasing the quality of VRMs overall. Not all of them, obviously, not all the time, but generally we've seen an uptick in that. And as part of that uptick, we've seen fewer designs with doublers anyway, especially in the high end. So this could actually end up leading to better designed VRMs anyway, which may be a good outcome for something where companies are forced to build around their marketing previously where they relied upon doublers. So that's it for now. As always, you can check the show notes in the link in the description below if you want to check out the sources for these stories. And you can go to store.garensaccess.net to pick up a media mod mat, a wireframe mouse mat, which is low in supply now, uh, or one of our other items, patreon.com slash gamersnexus, of course, to support us directly. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.